My daughter Adelaide has been through more tests than I care to remember, from MRIs to biopsies and countless blood draws. Some of the most informative tests, though, can be related to genetics. That is why I am excited to have Dr. John Millichap on the show today talking about the connection between epilepsy and genetics. This evolving field of study is a key element to identifying and curing many forms of epilepsy in the future. Dr. Millichap is an attending physician for neurology and epilepsy at Anne and Robert H. Leary Children's Hospital here in Chicago. He is also an associate professor of pediatrics and neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Millichap. I'm glad to be here. So um, we know that our DNA controls our eye color, our body type, but what is the connection between genetics and epilepsy? Sure. So. Uh, we know a lot about the causes of epilepsy, and on the same, in the same breath, I'll say we know very little. So uh, we know of you know, hundreds of genes that are related to epilepsy, and having a, a variation in the genetic code for those spe uh, specific genes alters the function of the machinery in the body that that gene codes for. So, uh, for example, a very um, common cause of, of epilepsy is related to ion channels. So um, a channel is like a, a hole. So if you can imagine a cell in the brain mm -hmm. uh, has a, uh, a wall to it and there's a, a small hole in that wall where salts like sodium and potassium uh, might go in and out and that, that balance of those salts going in and out is what keeps the electrical activity of the brain cells uh, stable. Uh, so if there's a variation in that piece of machinery, in that channel, uh, then the balance can be off. So where you have more electricity in that brain cell and more electricity then leads to seizures. So okay. that's just one example. There can be other genes that are related to the actual structure of the brain. So uh, they can lead to actual malformations of the brain that we can see on a picture like in an MRI. So talking about variants in the genetic code, you know, not all epilepsies are necessarily inherited. You get your, your test results back and they're talking about this variant or that variant. What causes those variants if it's not hereditary? Sure, this is one of the, the first things that I talk to parents about when I'm uh, leading into talking about doing genetic testing or re uh, recommending genetic testing is that most of uh, the you know, early onset uh, childhood epilepsies are actually uh, new in the child and not from the parents. So, um, you know, sort of back to basic biology, after the egg and the sperm come together, uh, then it forms the, the child. And the, the DNA has to be copied uh, every time the cell splits. And uh, in a normal, in, in everybody, you, me, uh, every time that that's copied, there's gonna be little mistakes, um, little changes to the DNA. And sometimes those changes don't make any difference whatsoever. And uh, we just go on uh, being ourselves. And then sometimes early on, uh, one little change will be then uh, important. It will change the function of, of that one gene, of that one piece of machinery that it can cause epilepsy and be in all subsequent cells in the body. So you, you get your epilepsy diagnosis or you know, in our case, um, we just saw developmental delay in our child, and that was when our neurologist started to order the genetic testing. Um, but you know, for a lot of people, it may be after that initial epilepsy diagnosis. What, um, what are the tests that are available? What are the tests that you order as a clinician? And you know, what are you looking for in those tests? Sure. I got into neurology about 11 years ago, and at that point, genetic testing was not uh, used in as a first-line uh, test whatsoever. Uh, things have changed to the point where uh, almost every patient that I see today, uh, once I've established the diagnosis of epilepsy, taken a history and looked at the EEG, the MRI, my examination, uh, and I haven't determined a cause uh, of the epilepsy, I'll talk to parents about the availability of genetic tests. Uh, and in many cases, the first test uh, would be a focus test that would look at genes we know to be associated with epilepsy. Uh, and this test is called a, a epilepsy gene panel. Mm -hmm. And it has a high sensitivity for those specific genes that we know 
uh, to be related to epilepsy. So maybe 100 or 200 genes uh, that uh, have a strong association with epilepsy are included on the panel. And once we've done this test, we know that there's not a change in those genes because it looks at it with such depth and, and accuracy. Uh, and if that's unrevealing, uh, we can go to the next step, which often involves the parents even more, where we'll take uh, the child's blood and then also the, the blood of the parents and look at all of the, uh, the portions of the, the DNA that make uh, machinery, make, it, make the body. That's called whole exome sequencing. Okay. Uh, and the reason we take the parents' blood is because, as I said, we all have little variations uh, that don't change anything in our bodies or, or have any uh, sig significance. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we kind of subtract uh, any of those inherited variations uh, from the child. So Right, so if you see the variant in the parent and then you're also seeing the variant in the child but the parent is symptom free, then that's probably not right. your culprit. Yeah, so the genetic testing company has uh, you know, a huge uh, computer that you know, does a lot of this initial sifting. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing that I'll constantly be reminding uh, other doctors and uh, trainees and parents is that the genetic testing that, that we do is not a static uh, test. So if you had an MRI last week and the radiologist read it and the neurologist looked at it, that happened. It's, it's, that is what the MRI shows. Uh, but if you had a genetic test last month or six months ago or a year ago, that test is not static. We're always learning new things. The, the variations that were meaningless or the genes that were meaningless to epilepsy a year ago may today be the cause for your child's epilepsy. So let's say you get through whole exome sequencing, and this was the case with our daughter. Um, there were some variants of unknown significance, but there was no uh, smoking gun, if you will. What does that mean, these variants of unknown significance? and? what do you do next when you still don't have an answer after you've done the whole exome sequencing? The terms that we use have changed over the last five years or so, mm -hmm. where instead of using the word mutation, which a lot of people think of, a, a change in the, the DNA that leads to disease, uh, the Genetics uh, uh, Professional Association got together and have made a pretty clear criteria for us doctors to um, to discuss these uh, findings with families and with individuals. So uh, now we have this sort of confusing or, or, or unknown uh, VUS, we call it, or okay. variant of unknown significance, that's right in the middle. And then above that, we have likely pathogenic or likely causing the disease, or in this case, likely causing the epilepsy, or straight pathogenic or causing the disease. And then on the other end, likely benign or likely not significant or just plain benign or, or not mm -hmm. the cause of, of the disease. So as you can imagine, VOS means we're not sure. So it neither has the criteria to make it definitely the cause or definitely not the cause. So um, I'll always warn parents when I send genetic testing that if we send this test, it may lead to, to more tests or it may lead to this, this um, uncertainty. Sure. So. Um, now, I mean, very recent, I mean, talking like within the last year, really, there is now whole genome sequencing that has become available. Mostly, it seems to me, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but really just on a research level, it's not fully available commercially. Um, what is the difference between the whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing? Uh, if how can you know someone get their hands on you know get submitted for testing for whole genome sequencing and what when should they? So, whole exome sequencing uh, has some differences from the the panels that I referred to first, uh, having two hundred genes that we look at very deeply mm -hmm. and we can be sure that we didn't see any changes in those genes. The whole exome is still very good, uh, but it doesn't have as many. Um, we call it reads. So. If you have a gene, uh, say, uh, you know, KCNQ2 is one cause of epilepsy that I'm uh, very familiar with, and say it, it, on a panel, it would read over it 200 times. 
Uh, so make, you know, it's like you read a book 200 times, you really know that book, right? And so then whole exome sequencing may only read over it 30 times or, or less. Uh, so it covers it, but not quite as deeply. Okay. And this is also the problem with whole genome sequencing. So it's an enormous amount of data. As you can imagine, whole exome is sort of the, the parts of the book that we can read um, uh, or, or we think makes the story. Mm -hmm. And then whole genome sequencing is everything. It's the binding, it's the, the cover, it's uh, you know, the, the spaces around the, the letters, it's everything, okay. uh, the entire, entire book. Uh, so it's even, you know, parts of the of the DNA that we don't know how they may be related related to, you know, uh, how how the body works, uh, and so that's an enormous amount of data. So um, we're we're learning more and more about how uh, variants outside of the, you know, traditional. Um, uh, readable portions of, of the DNA can lead to disease. So the, the whole genome sequencing is available clinically now, um, and uh, there's different companies that are, are making it available uh, for insurance uh, payment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still uh, you know, at a higher cost, and, but that will surely drop down. So I, I would say uh, that in the next you know, a few years um, that that technology will probably uh, take over uh, the other technologies that we have. Uh, and uh, at that point, if, if somebody had testing several years ago, it would probably be a good time to get retested if no, uh, no cause was found. And um, again, the, the number of reads will continue to uh, increase as the technology improves and the, the cost drops. So we've, we've got the tests, we know what we're looking for, the variants, we've, you know, the number of different tests progressively going up. Why should someone get tested? What is, you know, what's, what can they get out of knowing what's causing the epilepsy, aside from peace of mind to know that there is, you know, somewhere to direct their frustrations? Sure. <laughs> Well, and, and I think this is a really important point. And uh, I, you know, was trained in, in neurology, and we knew something about genetics back in you know 2007, 2008. We would be looking for various genetic causes of epilepsy. But it was 2012 when um, I, I really saw the the power of genetic testing. A patient of mine uh, was having you know t gene test after gene test after gene test. Uh, they were almost two years old at that point, uh, and we tested for Casey and Q2. They had seizures when they were born, and it came back with a, a variation. And the way uh, that was the cause of the of the epilepsy, mm -hmm. and the way that affected the family, really struck me more than anything else uh, that that I could see uh, it, with the, the value of genetic testing. It just changed their way that they you know, looked at their child and that the way that they approached um, uh, me and uh, the rest of, of the, uh, the community. It allowed them to then uh, combine or, or meet other families of children uh, who have uh, a, a genetic cause of epilepsy with the same genetic cause uh, and uh, gave them a lot of support, uh, which otherwise they didn't have. They said, we don't know why our, our child you know, can't, can't talk and... And a uh, prognosis. It, it gives us a better idea. Or at least a better idea of what that looks like. If you can look at other families, at other children who have a similar, you can be like, okay, this is what we can look out for. This is what we can expect. There's so much peace of mind in that. And then that, that's one of about 20 genes where it may change our approach. Uh, so we may choose different available seizure medications based on the genetic testing result. So tuberous sclerosis is a, a common cause of infantile spasms and other types of seizures. Uh, in the case of infantile spasms, we may prefer or, or recommend uh, one treatment over another mm -hmm. if we know that that's their cause. So uh, a genetic diagnosis there can, can really help us. And in KCNQ2, SCN2A, SCN8A, uh, several of these 
these are all names of, of ion channels or the, mm -hmm. the holes in the, the wall of the cell. We may choose a specific type of medicine, very common medicines uh, that uh, we use to treat epilepsy, but we may not think to use in such a young baby unless we have this specific genetic diagnosis. So it's changed my practice. I, I you know, look for the clinical signs of these genetic uh, causes of epilepsy, confirm them, and, and then I'll choose specific medicines for uh, that specific epilepsy. A cause of epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Genetic testing can so it can clearly be very helpful in terms of of treatment. I also imagine that it can be incredibly useful on the research side of things. If you start to understand the cause behind some of these epilepsies, then we can sort of focus our research and um, get closer to curing some of these epilepsies, I would hope. Do you have a sense of how genetics is changing epilepsy research? Yeah, absolutely. This, this uh, goes along with uh, some of my research interests as well. So back to that KCNQ2, it's actually one of the um, precision medicine genes, uh, so to speak. So uh, even before we knew that KCNQ2 was a cause of serious epilepsy, uh, a seizure medication that was uh, approved for the use in adults and uh, was going to be approved for children but was uh, only released for adults, uh, focuses on that gene or the, the, the channel that that gene makes. Um, just because uh, increasing the, the amount of uh, this potassium salt that goes out of the cell stabilizes things for everybody. So. Uh, a, a veteran who, who has a concussion, uh, a uh, person who had a stroke, an adult who had a stroke and has epilepsy, either of those people would also benefit from this medicine hmm. that targets that specific gene. So once we learned it causes uh, newborn onset uh, epilepsy, you know, it, it really opened our eyes to how important this system is for epilepsy and as a potential target for, for treatment. And, uh, the the work we've been doing for the last five years has been to, you know, try and see how we can use that drug or ones that are similar to it uh, to, you know, hopefully reverse not only the seizures, but then all the developmental consequences as well. These genetic tests can be so beneficial for prognosis, for treatment, but they can sometimes be difficult to obtain from the insurance companies because they are very expensive. What advice can you give to parents in trying to fight the insurance companies to, um, to approve this genetic testing, which can be so helpful? What, um, what conversations can they have with their doctors to, uh, to try and make sure that they can get this, this testing for themselves or for their, their child? Sure. So I, I think when things are new, uh, the insurance companies and the, the hospital systems have to you know, take, take some time to catch up. I'm sure in the 1980s when MRI was new, uh, there were doctors who said, well, we've been doing just fine with our CT scans. Why do I need this you know, newfangled test? Uh, but we've seen how helpful it's been with diagnosing more our children or, and our adults more accurately mm -hmm. uh, with epilepsy and, and led to improved outcomes and uh, probably lower costs overall. So I think genetic testing is there too. Uh, I think if I have a positive genetic testing result, I may do uh, fewer EEGs, I may do fewer MRIs, I may do fewer invasive tests like lumbar punctures, that's putting a small needle in the back to get the fluid mm -hmm. from around the brain, or muscle biopsies where I would take a, a portion of the muscle to look at under the microscope. So those tests were much more common uh, just 10 years ago and less frequently done now uh, because of the genetic testing results. So once we have that uh, result, there could be you know, enormous cost savings, uh, which the insurance companies will probably soon realize uh, that an earlier accurate diagnosis will lead to uh, better outcomes and, and better, better use of our resources uh, in the long term. But uh, really, the, the price has dropped so much. An EEG, especially one that's done overnight, uh, compared to a genetic test, the, the EEG is much more expensive. Really? Yes. Uh, and also a, an MRI that requires sedation mm -hmm. with all the anesthesia and, and all those other costs, much more expensive. So 
I think these things have really, really dropped down to uh, where they're less expensive, but you know, they, it's just a matter of um, being covered or not covered, mm -hmm. and we have to change the understanding. I have to constantly remind myself how new all of this testing is, that insurances, you know, these companies and, and doctors, and they're, they're really just learning how useful this can be and how it can cut down on the prices. I know I have found in speaking with parents who have children who are, you know, 10 years old, they've never had the genetic testing done because it wasn't available to them when their child was first diagnosed, where it was one of the very first tests that was um, done on Adelaide. And it's just so shocking to me how quickly genetics has taken off. Where do you see it going? Where, you know, what new, um, what new studies are being done out there? What new, um, what's on the horizon for genetics and epilepsy? Well, the, I think the testing will become uh, part of our common practice. So, uh, you know, once we determine a patient has had a seizure or, or epilepsy, uh, we'll do our usual uh, history taking exam, a uh, picture of the brain of some sort, MRI likely, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, EEG. And in, in most cases, we'll have a good idea of what, what the cause is maybe from those tests. Um, but even beyond that, I think we, we may want to know uh, what the underlying cause is or what the, the, the background of that patient is uh, going forward. So I'm, I'm going to go out uh, and, and say now that I think we'll be doing genetic testing on almost everybody uh, very shortly. Um, because even if you have a malformation of the brain, uh, that malformation must have come from somewhere. It must be mm -hmm. some genetic genetic change, or uh, if your child had a, you know, a, a stroke or had an infection and had a particularly bad response to the brain infection, there's, even though it may not be in an epilepsy gene, there's going to be some genetic predisposition to that child's over-exaggerated immune response to the bacteria, and there may be treatments that infectious disease specialists are looking at to uh, ameliorate that. Uh, so. Um, everything's genetic, I think, will be the, the mantra going forward. But genetic, Tell your kids to go into <laughs> genetics. <laughs> well, just, well, I, I, I you know, do a lot of this uh, myself, obviously. I'm able to talk to you about it, but genetic counselors are really helping uh, us sub-sub-specialists mm -hmm. uh, with this explosion in genetic testing. So uh, they're very important for uh, talking about all of the inheritance and mm -hmm. um, other other questions that come up that are you know, beyond my epilepsy wheelhouse, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's so exciting to me is that you know, we have these staggering statistics in epilepsy where you know, over half the people who are diagnosed don't know what is causing their seizures and just how helpless that can make a person feel when you just don't know why and how do you treat something if you don't know why. But I have to imagine that with the availability of genetic testing that we'll start to see those numbers come down, that mm -hmm. we'll start to see more and more people having an answer um, and less people being undiagnosed. Absolutely. I, I, I think that that, you know, as we talked about in the beginning of our conversation, just having a cause is so reassuring for families, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's, uh, you know, not a, a cure or uh, we don't have an answer today, uh, just meeting other families that are going through a similar experience, uh, avoiding you know, uh, further testing uh, that can be invasive or, or expensive mm -hmm. uh, is, is really important. And our, our goal of precision medicine is, is still there. It's, it's very complicated and uh, we're, we're inching towards it in different ways. Well, crossing fingers that we get there sooner rather than later. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today and for um, helping keep this very sciencey conversation <laughs> accessible to uh, the lay the lay person like myself. So I really do appreciate your time and um, letting me pick your brain. It was great talking with you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Millichap for his insights and experience on the genetics of epilepsy. While we have made steps towards understanding how genetics causes epilepsy, we have so much more to do. 
More than 50% of people with epilepsy still do not know the cause. Without this information, it can be extremely challenging to find the best treatment. But further funding of genetic epilepsy research could close this gap. Cure has been instrumental in leading us towards personalized medicine based on epilepsy and genetics. Help us do more by donating to Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy at seizinglife.com.